<laughs> hey, Michael, how are, how are you? you? Good to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, okay, I got it. I'm being recorded. I'm happy about that. Um, I've been very impressed with uh, your educational offerings. Uh, Chris sent me a link to the videos, and I was able to watch several, including one from Michael and one that a uh, couple that Molly did. Um, I was on there, so I was able to watch my last talk, and uh, it inspired me not to duplicate all that much from the last talk and try to give you something new today. And the title they gave me was something like Insights uh, into the Jet or something like that. So I just shortened it to Jet Insights. Uh, so I'm going to tell you some things today that by the end of the day, you're going to know more about jet ventilation than probably 95% of the people in North America. Truly, this first part of this talk, most people don't get to hear, but I'm really proud and happy that I can give it to you today. Uh, a little bit about me, if I get this working. There we go. I was a NICU therapist for about eight years at Primary Children's Medical Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. I went to work for Benell Incorporated January 4th, 1989. Many of you may know I met my wife on the Benel hotline. It was the first hotline call I ever took. She was putting her first baby on the jet. We bonded through crisis and I married, married her three years later. So we've been married for 30 years now. Um, but I retired in December of actually 2021. Uh, actually, it was 2020. I've got to correct that because it was just before the pandemic. And Benel, to their credit, in my retirement, gave me a mountain bike uh, and... I got back on the bike. I hadn't been on it. For, I had, still had an old mountain bike, but they gave me a new one. And it was a really good pastime in a pandemic, you know, to ride my bike. Uh, but they kept me on. I don't know if it's because of my mental Rolodex or something, but, you know, I've met a lot of people on this job and I've learned a lot. And I've created most of the uh, educational uh, materials that we use. So they kept me on as a clinical consultant, which allows me to come to places that I love, like Winnipeg. Um, I do want to dedicate this lecture to my mom. Today's her birthday. If she were still alive, if she hadn't been broadsided by a pickup, which sent her into a mental decline because of a right contra coup brain injury, uh, she would be 92 today. And uh, she was, she, I love this woman so much. She made me the man that I am. I hope she can be proud of that I can say that. <laughs> I hope, I'm, hoping that I'm the kind of man that she would be proud of. But this was her on her horse Flash when she was a teenager. Uh, she loved that horse. Uh, and even after her accident, when she was starting to come through, she talked about Flash. Uh, so I'm going to dedicate this lecture to my beautiful mother. Uh, jet Insights. What I'm going to talk about today is the origins of the jet. This is the part of, uh, of the talk that most people don't get. And uh, it, we're going to take a deep dive into the physics and the physical properties and the mechanics of how the jet came to be. Uh, how does the jet work? What principles was it based upon? I'm going to tell you that story. I'm going to try to make a case that the jet is probably the best thing uh, for avoiding gas trapping. Uh, is, that's especially important for micropremies. It turns out kids under 25 weeks, 22 to 24 weekers, have the smallest, most resistant airways we've ever created. Uh, and as one uh, neonatologist taught me, it's easier to recruit atelectasis than it is to try to resolve over distension and hyperinflation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why the jet is good at, at avoiding gas trapping in the first place or resolving it if it exists. I'm going to try to also make a case of something that we know for a long time is true, that the jet is probably the best ventilator you can use for avoiding or treating air leaks. This is how we got our FDA approval. Uh, FDA is, of course, the regulatory body in the United States. It's like your Health Canada. and um, our, our initial indications were for treating PIE. Uh, no ventilator up to that point could do it. Uh, and we turned out if we use it properly, we could avoid the PIE in the first place. But also pneumos, pneumopericardium, pneumoperitoneum, pneumomediastinum, T fistula. We're going to talk about T fistulas at the end of this talk. Um, it's really good for that. Uh, one of the insights I'm going to share with you is that the jet can detect inadvertent PIE. All ventilators can create inadvertent PIE, but there's a way that the jet works that allow you to detect it. Uh, and once you detect it, there's something you can do to resolve it. So I'll talk about that. Another insight is that the jet can be used on some pediatric patients. So I'm going to share with you a particular case study that is one of my favorites uh, by a physician that I met uh, during some very dire times on a pa pediatric patient that came very close to death. And ever since then, Dr. Joseph Laspata in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I have been friends, even on Facebook, <laughs> like I am with Michael. Um, 
Uh, the jet is being used increasingly in the OR. This is a brand new application that I really haven't talked about. There's a lecture I'm about to give you I've never given before. Uh, so I learned a lot from Dr. Michael Trainer in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's an anesthesiologist, and he's probably taught me the most about using the jet in the OR. And I'm going to tell you some of the particular nuances of that and some of the things that are so different about the jet when you're in the OR versus in the NICU. Uh, the jet needs a conventional ventilator to open and stabilize the alveoli, but there might be a better way to do it. I'm not going to talk a lot about the better way to do it uh, until my second talk. Um, so if you want to talk about it personally after this talk, I'd be willing to tell you about it. And then finally, the jet can be co converted to an oscillator, sort of. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So these are the insights I'm going to share with you today. Let's start with the first one, origins of HFJV. How did the jet come to existence? Turns out Dr. Bert Finnell, that's him on the left with the glasses when he was a graduate student at MIT. That's his little brother and his, and his big sister. And while he was at MIT, he started wondering. He saw a lot of babies dying from mechanical ventilation. Uh, it seemed to be these big volumes and high pressures that were killing babies, especially in the 1970s when he was getting his doctor of science degree at MIT. Uh, because his doctoral dissertation was on aerosolized surfactant replacement, he spent a lot of times in the newborn intensive care unit because that seemed to be the population that was going to benefit from this surfactant. Uh, and because of that, he saw a lot of babies dying. He said, if I can find a better way to ventilate, something that would allow us to use less pressure, less volume, I might be on to something. And so he did it. And the story I'm about to tell you is how it went from an idea to a device. It all started out when he was trying to figure out how to do this. Is it possible to use smaller tidal volumes and less pressure to ventilate a baby. And he found a study that was published in 1915. Actually, my clinical mentor, I just spoke at his memorial service, Dr. Tom Harris, he passed away, and I got to give a, a tribute to Tom. But Tom actually enlightened us to this article that was in 1915 by a guy named Henderson. He was a pulmonary physiologist, and he had a dog, and his dog would come back from a run, he'd be panting. And he thought, how can my dog do that? He's not taking big breaths. If I ran, <laughs> I'd be taking big breaths, but my dog takes a whole lot of little breaths. I wonder how he can do that without becoming hypoxic or hypercapnic. So he designed a study to try to find out how his dog could move gas in and out by taking tiny little breaths. So it's already starting to sound like high frequency, right? Little teeny breaths, but a whole lot of them. Uh, the study was kind of interesting. He, got a, he had colleagues out just like you guys are here. And he put a neon light behind this glass tube and he would take a puff of smoke off of the cigar and he would blow it through that tube like a pygmy blows through a dark gun, kind of a quick burst. But what he saw was the smoke penetrated through the tube in a long spike-shaped velocity profile rather than just moving in a bolus fashion through that tube. It happened that the smoke seemed to concentrate down the middle and there was very little contact against the sides of the glass. And um, it, it would penetrate deep down in using something that we call flow streaming. And then he would put his tongue, that's his tongue, by the way. <laughs> he put his tongue over the end of the tube to stop the flow. And as soon as he stopped the flow through the tube, the gas would diffuse. So diffusion would take over. So it's this convection diffusion kind of thing that he came across in 1915. And to Bert, this seemed to establish concept of the possibility of ventilating by not having to fill up all the airways with gas. If we could penetrate through the upper airways, we might be onto something. Uh, the effect is called flow streaming. And again, that's what we're trying to duplicate with the jet ventilator. Well, then he did something interesting. He got a glass bubble. He had his glass blower put a big bubble in the middle of the tube. And he thought, now, if I remove my tongue and if I blow through here, is the smoke going to circulate around the bulb before it exits? And it didn't. It got right past. Now, this is really important. I'll give you a preview of coming attractions for things like TE fistulas, upper airway disruptions. The jet seems to penetrate right past them. But we didn't know that at the time. Burr's just trying to come up with uh, a concept that might lead him to believe that you could ventilate with smaller tidal lines. Well, um, I thought I put another slide in here, but I guess I didn't. That, that was a good study, but in 1975, there was a study done by some of the pulmonary gurus at the Harvard School of Public Health, Jerry Mead and uh, some people like that. And what they were trying to do is come up with a device that could help them calculate airway resistance. 
To do that, they got a long tube. They put a pressure manometer in it, and then they put a flow meter in it, a volumetric flow meter. On the far end, they put a base woofer that they took out of a stereo speaker. They made this whole system airtight. And then they would plug the nose of the volunteer, and they had an FM modulator on the end, which if turned to the left would slow the woofer down. If turned to the right, would speed the woofer up. And what they found is as you speed the woofer up, you can imagine this, you can't, the, the amplitude has to diminish if you go faster. You can't go this far if you're going this fast. And so they knew that was going to happen. And that's exactly what had happened. As they began to push air into the lungs of these volunteers and pull the air out, the pressure would go up and the pressure would go down at low rates. But then they started to speed it up. And just like they thought, the amount of pressure they were moving in out of lungs uh, would diminish. There was this pressure attenuation phenomenon through the airways. And because of the researchers, they thought, let's go really fast, see what happens. You know, they're volunteers. They might have been prisoners or graduate students or fellows or somebody. And so they, um, they said, let's crank it up. And they cranked it up. And there was no advantage to going too fast because of colliding flows, chaos, um, gas trying to get in and out of the same, just too fast. But there was this point where they called resonant frequency where they got the best blood gases with the least amount of pressure. What surprised them about this whole thing was not that the pressure would diminish or the, ampl it would, the amplitude would attenuate. What surprised them is the folks are very comfortable. Even though they were going really fast with these small little pressure amplitudes, the, the volunteers reported that they felt quite comfortable. That's what surprised them. And then a very important thing they discovered was this, that um, there was this magic place called resonant frequency and it happened about four to eight hertz. The smaller you were, the faster they had to go. The larger you were, the slower they could go and still hit that place that they called resonant frequency, where you get the best blood gases with the least amount of pressure. And that was a real problem for Bert. As patients get smaller, you have to go faster. That bothered him because of things that everybody knows. I didn't know if there'd be some new people here. But um, so I threw this in, but we have a problem with the lungs and that's that there's a whole lot of airways and they get smaller and smaller as you go down them. And you finally get down to this point where you're at the distal airways in the alveoli where you might get gas exchange, but there's a whole lot of area up here where you're not gonna get gas exchange. We call it dead space, of course. Um, so Bert said, that's the problem, you know, they're using these little amplitudes, but how do you overcome the dead space? I got to get gas down to these distal parts of the lungs where I can actually get the good gas in and get the bad gas out. If I don't have contact, for instance, with my capillaries, uh, with the alveoli, uh, with alveolar capillary exchange, then I'm not going to get the oxygen going in. I'm not going to get the CO2 going out. So I've got to give enough blind to get down there. But in doing so, um, if I don't do it, I'm not going to get good gas exchange. How could you possibly use those little teeny breaths to still get good gas exchange? Um, and the problem with most ventilators, conventional ventilators, that is, is they have to fill up all that dead space to get down to the business end of the lung. And that requires more gas. And Bert said, that's my problem. I'm trying to invent a machine that uses less gas. How could I possibly do that? Um, oh, whoops. I guess I put these in. Oh, yeah. So getting back to this, he said, here's the problem. If I want to hit that low pressure amplitude where I get the best blood gases with the least amount of pressure, and if the smaller you get, the faster you have to go, that's going to be a problem. I'm not doing grown-ups. I'm doing babies. I want to save babies. And there's a problem with the alveolar air equation. The amount of the gas exchange you're going to get at the alveolar level equals tidal volume minus dead space. you got to overcome that dead space line to get enough tidal volume down to the business end of the lung to get good VQ matching. And at the time, they thought it would be about 5 to 8 mLs per kilo back in the 1970s. And he knew that anatomic dead space in all mammals, including everybody in this room and everybody watching, is about two mLs per kilo. So he had to overcome two mLs per kilo of dead space to get the gas down to where it needs to be to get the oxygen going in and the CO2 coming out. Um, and then he started thinking about that. You know, in that study, the smaller you were, the faster you had to go. And that's for grownups. I'm thinking about doing babies. I don't know what I'm going to have to do, but it's going to have to be really fast. Uh, I, and then he started thinking, I'm a mad scientist. This isn't going to work on babies. 
I'm thinking about pushing five to eight mLs per kilo of tidal volume in and out of lungs, not four to eight times a second. On a baby, because they're so much smaller, I'm probably going to have to go maybe 10 to 15 hertz, get good gas exchange, which is often where the oscillator runs. But he wasn't inventing an oscillator. He was inventing a jet. And so he said, I, I don't think it's going to work. So he abandoned all hope, and he went back to replacing surfactant back in the 1970s. Because this was the problem that he ran into. The question he kept stumbling across was, how can you possibly ventilate and oxygenate with tidal volumes that are smaller than dead space volumes? You know, when that amplitude diminishes, I'm going to be using really small tidal lines, and I got to overcome two mLs per kilo of dead space. You probably can't. And that's when he gave up the ghost. But then he came across this article. It was study into infrasound. Uh, infrasound is a low frequency sound wave in the range of about eight to 10 hertz. You can get it in your car. Uh, if you're driving down the freeway, the traffic was really bad coming in from the airport today. <laughs> uh, I couldn't get up fast enough to, to experience infrasound uh, because. It was rush hour. But if you get on a freeway or an expressway and you get going really fast, have you ever had that experience where somebody rolls down the back window and you hear that pop, 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 pop? That's resonant. That's infrasound. And it can be very irritating. And Colonel Daniel Johnson at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, got a whole bunch of money from the government to study infrasound because American fighter pilots were experiencing it in their aircraft. There was something that would vibrate in their their aircraft when they get up on these sorties on their on these missions with their jets that would cause earaches and headaches. And if you're exposed to it long enough, you can actually get feelings of intoxication. And he said that wouldn't be good for fighter pilots to have earaches, headaches, and feeling drunk. So I got to do something about it. So the government gave him a whole bunch of money to study infrasound. What he did with it was kind of interesting. This is a chinchilla I drew when I first started at Vanel in 1989. And I'm kind of, I could draw a better one now, but I'm kind of partial to him. He got chinchillas. I asked Bert, why chinchillas? He said, well, this was a sound study. This wasn't a ventilation study. It started off, they were just studying the effects of sound on, on hearing in the ears. Uh, and also they had a lot of money so they could afford chinchillas. And thirdly, he said, this was an Air Force base and animals have a tendency to die during research. So he thought we could make these great flight collars <laughs> for, our, for our jackets. And I don't know if that's true, but that's what Bert told me. Uh, but this animal didn't die. What happened was they put him in this airtight box and Colonel Johnson put a piston on the end with a, a little flywheel and he could push that piston in and out of that box. And his goal was to get up that range of infrasound, which is about eight to 10 pulses per second. So he would push, the, he would rotate that thing. The piston would go in and the piston would go out. And when he hit eight to 10 Hertz, the animal stopped breathing. Uh, and he thought, you know, killed him, but we can still use it. <laughs> uh, so he opened up the box and the animal was just fine. Even though he's bombarded with this stuff and he stopped breathing at eight to 10 hertz, he was okay. He was still alive. He was a little nervous, a little worse for the wear, but um, he didn't die and he didn't breathe for 30 minutes. And he thought that can't be true. So he shut the box and he started the piston again. And sure enough, when he hit eight or somewhere between eight and 10 hertz, the animal would stop breathing. And he thought, I don't know what's going on. So he got another chinchilla, put it in. And he, again, they're studying sound. They don't know anything about ventilation at this point. The animal would stop breathing between 8 to 10 hertz. Every chinchilla he put in there didn't matter. And he thought, I don't know what's going on here. So he went to bed. He got up the next morning, and he had a, an epiphany. He said, I've reinvented the iron lung. That's all I've done. The only difference is the animal's head is inside the box instead of outside. And so I talked to one of my old mentors, Jack Emerson, before he died. He used to come to our Snowbird Conference. A wonderful guy. He was one of the innovators of the Iron Lung. He met his wife in an Iron Lung. He, he got her in there at an expo in San Francisco in the late 1930s. He wouldn't let her out until she gave him uh, her name and address or a phone number, I think it was. And so he, And he was married for over 50 years to this wonderful woman. But he used to come out to our Snowbird Conference on high-frequency ventilation. And I ran this by him. And I said, uh, do you know about you know, that Colonel Johnson stuff, and he goes, oh yeah, classic iron lung technology. The only difference is the head was not outside the box. So if that was a glass box, you wouldn't even see the animal's chest move. But if the animal's glottis is open and you uh, push the piston in, what's going to happen to the pressure? I said, the pressure is going to go up, right? And he goes, yeah, because you're making a smaller space. You have the same amount of gas, but it's in a smaller space. So the pressure is going to go up. But the molecules are really smart. This is how an iron lung works. It says 
I'm going to jump across this thorax of this open thorax or open glottis of the animal and equalize the pressure across the thorax. And if you pull the piston out, which he did, eight to times a second, what's going to happen to the pressure in the box? It's just going to drop, of course, because when it goes out, there's the same amount of gas, but in a slightly larger space. And he goes, right. So the molecules say, well, let's get out of here. We're going to explode the animal's chest. If you do that fast enough, you're going to take away the animal's respiratory drive. And that's probably all he did. And so Bert started thinking about that. Well, this is great, but the deflections in that box were very minimal. They couldn't have been using very much tidal volume. So he called Colonel Johnson on the phone and he said, hey, I'm just curious how much tidal volume we're using when the animals stop breathing. I don't know. It was a sound study. Um, well, how, what were their blood gases? I don't know. We didn't really look. We were just checking hearing. We had all kinds of sophisticated equipment for their audio stuff. So I don't really know how much tidal volume I was using, but we can calculate it. So he got a couple of cases out of his file and he over the phone with Bert, they converted decibel changes to pressure changes. I think using Boyle's law, they converted pressure changes to volume changes. And Colonel Johnson said, well, it looks like in every case, the animal was using one to two milliliters per kilogram of tidal volume. And Bert said, no way. And Colonel Johnson said, wait, no, I don't think they talk like that. But <laughs> that's basically what they were saying. Bert said, that can't be true because one thing I know is the great equalizer in the mammal world is dead space volume. Every animal, no matter how small or insignificant or how big and strong, has about the same amount of dead space volume, about two mLs per kilo. How could you possibly use less tidal volume than dead space volume? That just seems impossible. And Colonel Johnson said the magic words for a guy like Bert. He said, why don't you find out? And Bert said, hey, good idea. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to do that. So Bert went down in the basement of MIT when he heard he was a graduate student working on his doctorate. And he put together the first high frequency jet ventilator. The valves were kind of crude. that would last for, I think, two to three hours. And they'd blow in. He started putting cats on it. And in 1975, he said, I want to find out if you can possibly get good blood gases with smaller tidal volumes. And so what he did was he, he uh, started cranking up the volume on this new ventilator that he created. And sure enough, as soon as he got a good blood gas, he would look at how much tidal volume they were using. And the faster he went, the smaller the amount of tidal volume it took to ventilate the animal until he hit something called corner frequency. And once you hit corner frequency, further increases in rate aren't going to help you. So 420 on the jet now is probably corner frequency. And anything up, up above that doesn't give you much of an advantage and just makes you more prone to gas traffic. But uh, this was on a healthy rabbit, so it didn't take as much frequency. But on a sick baby, it takes more. And Bert said, wow, it works. But he wondered how. <laughs> I don't know how my own machine works. What's going on here? And so he met a guy uh, in the Bay Area in San Francisco, down in San Jose. His name was Roger Ellis. And as a hobby, Roger mathematically modeled gas flow through the lungs. So he's kind of a nerd. But he's the perfect guy. His job was designing computer chips for uh, laptops. And Bert said, when he called him, what's a laptop? <laughs> it's 1984. And he goes, oh, they're going to be the rage someday. And Bert said, I'll believe it when I see it. But how, how does designing computer chips help me understand you when you try to tell me how my ventilator works? And he goes, because as a hobby, I mathematically model gas for the lungs. And so he's the perfect guy because that's his passion. And so Bert went down to the Bay Area and he met with him. And this is what Roger told him. Roger said, to understand how the jet works. And again, you guys are going to know more about the jet than at least 95% of people in North America. You have to understand the nature of flow. There's three types of flow in nature. And a stable flow is one that nature can support. So you have to go out for a walk in the hills and see this flow happening in a creek or something. Uh, one is laminar flow. It's very stable. You can see it in a slow moving river. Uh, turbulent flow, you can see it if you see a rapid in a river. But there's one kind of flow that is not stable in nature, and that's transitional. It's somewhere between laminar and turbulent. And you found a way to stabilize transitional flow with the jet. You got it? And Bert said, no. <laughs> what do you mean? He goes, well, let's take a closer look. He said, laminar flow is a parabolic or bullet-shaped velocity profile. If you throw a stick out in the middle of the river and your little kid throws it on the bank, you're always going to beat him in a boat race or like a stick race because it's going to be moving a little faster in the middle 
than it is against the banks. That's laminar flow. You can, and that's kind of how a conventional ventilator works. Big bolus flow comes down and it might be moving a little faster in the middle of the airways than against the sides. There's also turbulent flow. That's flow that's all over the place. It's sort of like a rapid. Uh, he said, but the velocity profile is not parabolic. It's blunt or block shaped. What that means is no matter where you throw the stick, that stick has the potential to go just as fast as any other stick because the water is moving through the channel in a fairly uniform velocity. And Bert said, oh, that's gotta be how the jet works, really fast. And he goes, no, 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 hold your horses. You found a way to support transitional flow. If you take laminar flow, let's say you take the Red River and you start running it down the mountains of Utah, the steeper it gets, the faster that water is gonna go. And this velocity profile is gonna get elongated. Where when it's no longer laminar, but it's not yet turbulent, that's transitional. And it's moving much faster down the middle than it is against the base. And Bert goes, oh. 1915, Henderson. That's exactly what he showed us way back in 1915. And Bert said, that's great, but um, how am I doing it? <laughs> and he said, it's that little adapter you have. Uh, you have a large tube. The gas has to go through a small tube. The only way the same amount of gas can get through a smaller tube is to accelerate. It's a Bernoulli effect. That's why that corner in Winnipeg is one of the windiest corners because you know, in North America, because these flows of these volumes of air, these masses of air come across the plains and all of a sudden they hit a big city and they got to find a way to get through the city. So they speed up. That's the Bernoulli effect. If you haven't seen it for a while, I created this goofy slide to show you. Fire Chief Bernoulli comes in, but he forgot his nozzle. The water's coming through the hose but it has no reason to accelerate. So whoop, it just kind of dribbles out. That's now the lungs are in trouble because you're on a conventional ventilator, basically. That's my metaphor there. <laughs> and Fire Chief Bernoulli says, I forgot my nozzle. He's Italian. Uh, so he brings his nozzle and here comes the water and the water says, how are we going to get through there? There's a restriction. I know. If we speed up, we can all get through. And he said, that's how you've created transitional flow or stabilized. It's not a stable flow in nature. But you found a way to support double helical bidirectional flow. And Bert said, double what? <laughs> what is that? And he goes, break it down. Double helical is two things swirling. Bidirectional is opposite directions at the same time. Bert said, you mean to tell me when a baby's on the jet, gas is going in and coming out simultaneously? He goes, yes. That's why secretions come out. That's why meconium comes out. Uh, it's two flows swirling in opposite directions. And so really, this is how it works, the jet. It shoots gas down the center of the airways. And then Bert had another aha moment. He goes, that's how we can use smaller tidal volumes. We're not filling up the upper airway dead space volume. Roger Ellis calculated that this occurs through about the first four to six bifurcations of the lung. After that, diffusion starts to take over. Other mechanisms are responsible for gas exchange. But the biggest part of the dead space is the first four to six bifurcations. If we had to fill that up, we could use smaller tidal volumes. So Bert's dream was realized. He could ventilate with smaller tidal volumes and he could bypass upper airway disruptions like T fistulas. Uh, so he, he did find a way to get gas down to the alveolar sacs and to the alveolar ducts uh, just by shooting through the dead space. But gas has to get out. And this is what Roger said, double helical bidirectional flow. Same time gas is going in, it's swirling out around the incoming gas. The exhale gas is coming out passively. We don't suck the gas out with the jet. So it's got to find the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is around the incoming gas. So if you, if you ever, if you accidentally tip a circuit and water goes into baby's lungs, you'll be relieved to see that it comes flying right back out. We've done it on a Tesla, lung, but I don't dare try it on a baby. <laughs> uh, but it really does. You know, if there's something down there like meconium asters, we found early on that the jet could mobilize meconium just like the oscillator does too. Uh, it tends to vibrate the chest and it can bring things out. Um, and also CO2 rich dead space gas. Um, we think the jet is constantly sweeping out the CO2 rich dead space gas as well, which is another reason it's a very effective ventilator for removing CO2. Okay, that's the longest part of the talk, but I thought it was really important that you guys really understand the basics of how the jet develops. So is the jet the best for avoiding gas trapping, which is especially important for the smaller babies? 
Um, we think it is. One of the big differences between the jet and the oscillator, this was taught to us by Dr. Allison Fraze in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. She worked with Jay Bryan in Toronto to help develop the Centromedics oscillator. And she took the jet from us and she did a whole bunch of studies with the jet. And she taught us more than anybody up to that point. And uh, she said, it's important for you guys to understand that there's a big difference between the jet and the convention and the uh, uh, oscillator. And one of the big difference, there's three main differences. And she said, probably number one is eye time. The oscillator has a fixed percentage eye time. No matter what your rate is, the eye time is going to be a 33, 25 to 33% of whatever that is. If you're lucky enough to live in Canada, you can have a one to three I ratio. But if you're in America, you only have a one to the two I ratio because we don't have the Drager or the Fabian or anything like that. But regardless, wherever your rate is, the, whenever you change the rate, your eye time is going to change right along with it. Uh, the jet has an adjustable eye time. That means the eye time won't change when you change the rate. You have to adjust the eye time if you want to change the eye time. So what that means is it's really important, especially in these tiny little babies that are prone to gas trapping. Uh, with the oscillator, Let's say you're running at 10 hertz and you're at a one to two IE ratio. Um, and you say, boy, we're trapping gas. We want to give a longer expiratory time. Let's lower the rate. So you go down to six hertz. Well, you did give a longer expiratory time, but you also lengthened your eye time. So it didn't buy anything. You're, putting, you're trying to get gas out and you're putting more in to get out. Uh, so you're always going to be stuck at that one to two. Now in Canada, you have the luxury of instead of being at 33%, you can go to 25 because you can get a one to three IU ratio. But still, you, it's a fixed percentage of your cycle. With JET, uh, when you um, lower the rate, all that happens is your expiratory time gets longer. So it's hard to imagine you can say this in the same sentence, but the JET, the high frequency JET ventilator is capable of a one to 12 IU ratio, 12 times longer for exhalation than inhalation. Um, and that gives more time for exhalation, which will reduce gas trapping. And we think we've seen a lot as we start to get smaller and smaller babies into our NICU that one of the biggest problems you have is trapping gas. So I'll talk a lot more about that in my second talk today. Uh, we think the JET is probably the best thing for avoiding and treating air leaks. Uh, again, Bert's dream was to create a machine that could give smaller tidal volumes and very, very short eye times, which would translate into lower pressures. And that's kind of the magic. Uh, Jane Pillow in Australia, she's the one that kind of taught us this, um, she measured the tidal volumes to be somewhere between 0.4 and 1.2. And that's the secret math of the jet really is, if you can give very small tidal volumes and very short eye times, you're gonna give the smallest possible peak and mean alveolar pressure. Now the problem is that's not gonna do the trick. How are you gonna re remove CO2 or oxygenate just because you're given teeny little volumes for very short periods of time? That's why rate still matters. That's why we do high frequency, is that's your minute ventilation. If you're giving little breaths, just like we learned about the panting dog in 1915, you've got to give a lot of them. And that's the secret math of the jet. But what that means is, is this, really, that if you, with a conventional ventilator, when you give volume, it goes down, and the bulk of the pressure, we measured sometimes 95% of the pressure you've set on the jet actually gets to the alveolar level that can create a lot of problems. Uh, one of the things that it can do is it can compress capillary beds, it can disrupt pulmonary vascular blood flow. Uh, it also is responsible for creating pneumos. So what the jet tries to do is using these tiny little tidal lines for very short periods of time, we don't reach the alveoli. It's been estimated by Allison Fraze that only about five to 7% of the pressure actually gets to the alveoli. So don't be afraid of the pressure on the jet. Because a PIP of 30 is probably less than three distally. And it, we found out that it doesn't seem to disrupt hemodynamics. And we've had the ability to resolve air leaks with the jet. So we're pretty excited about that. To really demonstrate this, I often carry a test lung with me. 16, uh, by, 16 alveoli, I guess. And sometimes I'll take a, a balloon off and I'll stick it underwater. We had a fish aquarium back at Pinnell when I worked there. And I, one day I stuck this lung underwater and we had an old bear cub. Some of you may not remember this. Somebody as young as Molly says she probably doesn't remember this unless it's from the history book. That's for you, Molly. Um, but you can see that, um, let's see. Oh, there, I'll use that one. You can see right there that my eye time is set at 0.5 seconds. And my rate is what, 25? But I've only, the important thing is I've only set my PIP 
at 20. And there's 20. On the jet, I set the pip at 30. So there's my pip of 30 in the control section. And once I got up to 30 in the monitor section, I, then I, I looked at my test lung underwater and this is what I saw. Now remember the jet is on 10 centimeters of water more pressure. But remember all we've learned today about tidal volumes and smaller tidal volumes and less pressure and attenuation down the airways. And this is what happened. Every time the conventional breath came, some of you may have seen this video before, I've been showing it for years, but you can see that most of the volume reaches the, on the conventional aggravates the airway. You can also see how crappy the jet is at trying to reverse that electrosis. This is why we sometimes have to give a side breath if we have a baby who's that lactatic. The jet's too wimpy to reverse out electrosis. Uh, the jet can detect inadvertent peep. How does it do that? Well, this is, I took right from my manual. I wrote the manual and I illustrated it. So I was kind of proud of it. You know, it's my first manual. But I, I did draw this uh, life port adapter. And the important part here is this number three right here. Number three is the pressure monitoring line. We used to use a triple lumen endotracheal tube in the conventional endotracheal tube adapter. This pressure monitoring line used to terminate right at the tip of the end of the tracheal tube. And we love that because it could detect inadvertent peep. In other words, if the pressure is higher at the distal end of the ET tube than it is at the proximal end, you're probably trapping gas. Gas can't get out fast enough, so the pressure is higher down here than it is out here. And we didn't want to lose that ability, so we tasked our engineers. We don't want to have to reintubate the patient to use the jet, but we still want to detect those distal pressures. And so they found a way to control attenuation through that tube. Um, it, they, uh, here it is. Um, the attenuation through this tube is controlled in such a way that by the time it reaches the transducer, it's approximating distal tip pressures. So we did several animal studies to dial it in and get it right. And so what you see displayed on the jet is an approximation of what's going on at the tip of the end of the tube, And it's very accurate. Um, and uh, remember that, that when a baby's on the jet, you have the ability to detect distal peep. So what that means is if you look at the peep on the jet, right here on this fake baby, <laughs> uh, we have 9.6. This is our favorite little guy that we use at Benil. Um, but we have a peep of 9.6. If you're set at a peep of, say, 8 on the conventional, and the jet's reading 9.6, that's gas truck. So what you do if you see that is, uh, you know, it means that the jet peep is high. If it reaches or exceeds the conventional peep, it could indicate gas trapping. Uh, so do two things. Number one is make sure you have enough peep. Sometimes people turn down their peep if they're trapping gas. But you got to have stable airways. And you can turn the peep up higher on the jet than you can on a conventional because you're not giving those big bolus pressures. So make sure you've optimized your peep. But the best way to get rid of it is probably by lowering the rate. If you feel you have adequate PEEP to stabilize the airways and the alveoli, lowering the jet rate will help correct inadvertent PEEP. Make sense? Okay. The jet can be used on some pediatric patients. Uh, this is kind of an emotional case study for me. I, because I think of my own, I, I don't think I could work in the PICU because it's, you know, Sometimes little micropenis look like aliens. So you don't think of them as much as like a seven-year-old who got hit in the head during a skiing action or something. I've seen those where their heads, it's just hard to see a pediatric patient. But we still have to take care of these kids. And this was a seven-year-old girl. She was 25 kilos. She went to the movie Titanic with her mom and dad. Couldn't have been safer. Dad was on one side, mom was on the other. It was the second night of the movie's release at a small theater in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The theater owner was very honored to get the movie at his theater, but it was the second night. The first night, the theater was so crowded, he said, I got to build a queuing maze to guide traffic in. So he built a queuing maze using uh, concrete obelisks. They looked like the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. in the United States, but they were about seven and a half feet tall. The grand looking entrance to the theater, and he connected them with these chains, big, beautiful chains. And uh, But he put the chains a little too high. <laughs> so this little girl's getting to the beginning of the maze, which is near the end of the line, and their parents are talking, and she starts swinging on this chain. And that last obelisk comes down over on top. Of, she sees it coming. So she did the worst thing she could do is she fell to the ground. She gasped. 
So she fills her lungs with air and the thing hits her in the chest. And she had all this gas suddenly in not very much space. And so pressure skyrocketed. She immediately blew bilateral pneumos. There was a lot of subtree emphysema, partly not because her lacerated liver, but because of a tracheal tear. There was a hockey stick. Do you, do you know what hockey is in Canada? Kidding. <laughs> of course, you bend in hockey, basically. National. I, I love, I always cheer for Canada, I got to say. I love Canada. But there was a hockey stick shaped tear that came down past your left main stem over into her right. And the surgeon put in the notes, it was a prolonged and difficult surgery. When I got to go back to Broward General Medical Center where this patient was treated, I talked to the surgeon. I said, what did you mean by prolonged and difficult? And she said, it took me four hours to do a 45-minute repair. I said, normally I can patch a tear like that in 45 minutes. But because of all the ventilation she was on to keep her alive, uh, it was very tough repair. We finally got it closed. We closed the chest. We took her back. And we gave her to Dr. Joseph Laspada. There he was celebrating the holiday with, uh, he's a pizza intensivist that had a lot of experience with the oscillator. I love Joe. He's a wonderful guy. And uh, they started the patient on mechanical ventilation. But she was very difficult to ventilate, not only intraoperatively, but postoperatively, she was a nightmare because she had conflicting problems. She had very poor compliance complicated by pulmonary airways. The compliance is saying, I need a high volume strategy. And the airlinks say, no, we need a low volume strategy. How do you do both? Well, I would have put her on the oscillator because it can ventilate a lot bigger kid than the jet can. And that's what Joe did. And he knew the oscillator well. And he tried a whole lot of things. He couldn't get her under control. Uh, so they failed. They had a machine that could measure CO2 so greater than 150 at that time. And uh, her CO2 was 285 and her pH was 665. So that's death's door. And uh, they panicked uh, and they put her on a Servo 300, which we used to use in those days. And uh, they said, let's try pressure regulated volume control, which was a big mode back then. And we'll let the ventilator decide how much PIP it needs to do this. And they said, I'll need greater than 60. They said, we can't do that. That's barotrauma. Let's try pressure control and let the ventilator decide how much volume, but it can only generate one cc per kilo in this kid because of a number of factors, including her injuries. Uh, so it's kind of inverse volume trauma, just not enough volume. And uh, she's going down. And the RTs, to their credit, probably saved this kid. So they went to Dr. Lospada and they said, Dr. Lospada, what are we going to do? We got to save. She's a beautiful kid. Doesn't deserve this life. You know, we, she deserves life, but not this death. Uh, we got to save her. You know, we all try so hard to save our patients. And they were no different. And he said, well, we can't. Her pH was never been above 6.8. Her CO2 got down to 195 when you put her on the conventional ventilator, but it's taken a turn for the worse. It's back up in the high 280s now. Um, we used to be able to get pretty good saturation, but we're losing that now too. Um, hemodynamically, she's a nightmare. And they said, why don't we send her down to Miami for bypass? Uh, and they said, he said, we can't. She's too unstable. She'll die on transport. You have to accept the fact that not everybody lives. So these three RTs ran up to the NICU and they got the jet and they came down and they said, Dr. Vespada, can we try it? I said, sure. What do we got to lose other than the most important thing, which is the patient? Um, so they called the Benel hotline. <laughs> they got Bert on the phone. Dr. Benel took the hotline call and they said, Bert, can you use it on a pediatric patient? He goes, yeah, there's precedent for that. We've, we've done some pediatric patients, but you got to do things differently on a bigger kid. A bigger kid, a rate of 420 has been working for a lot of neonates. But on a kid this big, you're going to have to run as low as possible. They said, why? Mm -hmm. Said, because you're going to be putting a lot more gas to hit the pressure on a 25 kilo kid than you would, you know, a thousand gram kid. The more gas you put in, the longer it takes to get the gas out. It's time constants. You've got to give enough time to get the gas out. That'll give you a one to 12 IU ratio. So just go to 240 and max the pip out. Go to 50, that's as high as it can go, which is the, one of the most limiting factors on a pediatric patient with the jet. Because you can only go to a, a PIP of 50. And if you're using a higher P, that limits your delta P. So we're using more and more I, extended eye times on bigger patients. But at the time, we didn't know about eye time working for bigger kids. And at some point, they dropped the rate to 40, or the PIP to 40. And I asked them when I went down to Fort Lauderdale, why did you guys do that? And they said, we just felt really good about her. She was looking good. We took a chance. And, Turns out it was a good thing we did. 
But at that point, they called the Bunnell hotline and they said, Bert, her chest tubes are bubbling. And he said, with any kind of frequency? They said, yeah, every two seconds they bubble. Remember my underwater test lung? <laughs> he said, you got to get her off that rate of 30. How'd you know we're on a rate of 30? You're amazing. No, I'm not amazing. It's just that every two seconds, that conventional breath is aggravating your chest tubes. They said, well, we got a ventilator. He said, the rate doesn't ventilate. The rate is just for reversing out electrosis. That's the only reason to use a, a conventional rate on a jet. So I'd go to CPAP. You may have to raise your peep a little bit. So when they went from uh, a peep of 10, uh, when they were given a rate of 30, they had to go up a little bit to maintain mean air pressure, which was fine. I'd rather be on a CPAP of 14 than getting all those big breaths. And then they cross their fingers. Sometimes that's your, the only thing you, you got left or, you know, prayer, whatever your deity is. That's what they did. Everybody pay, prayed to their particular deities. And, uh, one hour and 15 minutes, they got a blood gas and the pH was 721 and the CO2 was 72. And Dr. Laspada said, no way. Broken machine, wrong gas, uh, fluke. And they said, no, no, maybe. It's her blood. It's the machines working. But um, it could be a fluke. What do we do? And he said, wait an hour and repeat the blood gas. Don't make any changes. And so they, they waited. But sometimes RTs are impatient. I, I, I'm an RT and I, I'm that way. They said, to hell with it. You know, 55 minutes. They went five minutes short of an hour. They said, let's repeat the blood gas. And the pH was 7.52 and the CO2 was 26. So it was a remarkable turnaround on this kid. Um, and it, it was one of the first kids to show us we could ventilate PICU patients, certain PICU patients. On day six, they switched her back to the conventional ventilator, which nowadays we wouldn't do that. Nowadays, we tend to extubate to non-invasive. Uh, and I, in my second talk, I'll tell you how to do that successfully. Uh, they repeated the bronchoscopy on day eight, and the tracheal tear was healing quite nicely, as well as they could have hoped. They probably had some lingering uh, air leak problems, probably because they were still on the conventional ventilator. If they would have extubated from the jet to NIV, they probably would have avoided that. But they did take the last chest tube out on day 10 because they were weaning their conventional support. And uh, on day 11, they extubated her, and 14 days after that, she went home. It was a remarkable case. And I said to Dr. Laspada, how is she? You know, that was very traumatic. And those are horrible blood gas. And he said, she's great. Uh, the family came back in a few months later to thank everybody that had saved her life. And uh, I got to have lunch with them. And I said, so Sarah, how are you feeling? And she took a big breath, which was a miracle in itself. And she said, I'm a little tired, but I'm okay. <laughs> and he said, I started jumping around. My stethoscope flew off. I said, yes, I'm so excited. She goes, Dr. Laspada, why are you so excited? He said, because of CO2 of two, I'm just really happy. You know, he didn't want to scare her. But uh, just a remarkable case. Um, my third to the last, my, uh, yeah, third to the last uh, insight into HFJV is how it's being used in the OR. This is really new for us. Uh, it's been used for a while in, at Duke University and also in Albany, New York. But now Canada is leading the charge. There's two hospitals in Canada that have taught me more about using the jet in the OR than anywhere else. One's Children's in British Columbia, and the other one is uh, Children's in uh, Calgary, Alberta Children's. And they're both using it routinely in the ER, but this is how it came about. Dr. Michael Trainer is at Children's Hospital in British Columbia. And these are his slides and he shared them with me. He and I did a talk at a conference and I took a picture. That's Dr. Trainer right there on the left. That's another anesthesiologist introducing him. And I watched Dr. Trainer's talk and I learned a lot from him. And he sent me a video of one of the talks that he did. And he showed about three studies, but all of them basically showed the same thing that you know, when you're doing these repairs, especially with thoracoscopy, uh, th these kids could be on really high CO2s for a long time. And he said, based on all the studies that I've looked at, everyone showed the same thing, that ventilation of these babies is not trivial. And one of the biggest problems is controlling CO2. He said, often on conventional ventilation or, or a handbagging or something, uh, we have to stop the procedure. The surgeons have to stop while I get the blood gases under control. And he said, so it's not easy. I said, well, how did you come about using the jet? And he goes, well, we started using it because initially we were having problems with diaphragmatic hernia kits. They were really tough to keep ventilated well. Um, but they were stabilized, doing well on the jet, but we didn't use the jet in the OR. So we'd try to wean them off the jet in order to take them to surgery. And uh, we started getting higher risk babies, more difficult babies coming through the surgical unit. 
And we'd always try to take them off the jet before they came in. And it was uh, rocky and operative, uh, intraoperative and postoperative ventilation uh, when we got them off the jet because they were doing pretty well on the jet. And we thought maybe we should have learned how to use it in the OR. And so this is what he found is one of the advantages you have, he's really gone to TEF repairs. That's one of his big uh, applications of the jet in the OR. And that was TEFs for all those reasons we talked about early on in this lecture. Uh, and he said, not only do you bypass the upper airways, but uh, you know, you're going to give pretty high pips in the ET tube when you start the jet. But because of that rapid attenuation, he said, I'm only seeing about 5% of the pip, uh, probably uh, getting down to the alveoli. It, it does attenuate quickly. And we have a study to demonstrate that that we did in-house. Uh, the other thing is um, proximal air leak. You know, sometimes when you're trying to do these TF kids, you keep getting air leak through the fistula. Uh, with the jet, we could raise our pip up and we just don't have any problems. We crank that pip up even as high as it can go, which is 50, uh, and we don't have problems with air leaking through um, the proximal leak. Um, and we've also learned the importance of eye time. If you hit a pip of 50 and you still can't get the CO2 under control, we start raising the eye time on the jet. And we can always get the CO2 under control. He said, what I'm most pleased about is the surgeons love the jet when, when a kid comes in. Uh, because they said we don't have to keep stopping the procedure as often because the babies are more stable. It's, he said, right now we're doing studies to try to find out uh, if we can shorten the operating times and also if we can reduce long-term complications. And once he gets those out, I'll be able to come back and share them with you. But this is, I made these slides to show you what, why the surgeons love it. The surgeon gets in there and he has to split the chest maybe, and then he pulls things out of the way. But on a conventional ventilator, this is typically what happens. So he puts clamps in, he tries to keep things under control, but the lungs are always trying to interfere with the procedure. And the patients are less stable because you have to move the chest to, to get good blood gases. So he said, when we go in with the jet, what we're really seeing is that um, the jet just kind of wiggles. We have photographs that they've taken of the lungs during jet ventilation versus conventional. And it's just remarkable how much less cardiac interference we have. Uh, and we said with T fistulas and diaphragmatic hernias, anything, there's just less complications inside the thoracic cavity. So we really like that. Now, the biggest thing we found is that normally uh, in the NICU, if you're changing PIP to control CO2, you might go one to two centimeters at a time on your PIP. Small changes in PIP have a dramatic effect on CO2. So you might make small changes. Uh, sometimes there's, a, you know, there's exceptions to every rule. And sometimes, you know, if you get a CO2 of 120, you're not going to go one or two at a time. But as a general rule, we, we make small changes. He said, not in the OR. He said, in the OR, I'm changing that PIP sometimes as many as 15 centimeters at a time. And you can imagine why. You know, you've got lungs that close in a chest. You crack that chest. He said, if we're doing a procedure where you have to crack the chest, all of a sudden, everything changes. You know, there's less resistance from the thoracic cavity. The compliance suddenly gets really good. Uh, so we have to crank the pressure really fast. And because we have good AAs, anesthesiology assistants, RTs that know how to use a jet, we do pretty well. So what I've learned from Dr. Trainer is lung manipulation and teeth fistulas are very complex. and They can complicate the procedure. Um, so uh, it's hard to control CO2 sometimes. It's not a trivial thing, he said. And the jet can play a vital role. It's what we're learning. And I'm just so excited about what's going on in Canada right now with the jet in the OR. And uh, he said that we really have these excellent RTs uh, as anesthesiology assistants, and they really run the ventilator. I'll tell them, hey, you know, the CO2 drop and crank that pressure, and they'll, they'll know how to do it. But it's really good because it takes a lot of pressure off me, he said, and I can pay attention to other things. Um, Almost finally, the jet needs conventional ventilation. I'm going to go into a lot more detail. Uh, the part back there at the end that says, but there may be a best way to do it. I'll talk about that. In the, and I've talked about it in my previous talks. That basically, it's uh, long eye time, low pressure ventilation. I'm going to try to make a case for that. But as you saw when I put the test lung underwater, the jet's really lousy at trying to reverse that electrosis. Uh, so here's really what we're trying to do with the jet. These are incredible subplural microvideographs I got from Gary Neiman's lab in Syracuse. He's retired now, but before he retired, he shared with me these incredible videos. And he, I went to his lab and he showed me how he did it uh, on these rats. These are rat lungs. 
And on the left, he's giving about six mLs per kilo. Uh, and he's on a PEEP of five. And watch what happens. This is the number one reason babies get hurt on a conventional ventilator, is a bad distribution of volume. The hardest thing you're gonna do with a ventilator is get the volume to go where you want it to go. Gas has a tendency to follow the path of, well, the path of best compliance. So you can see that Alvillus in the middle, he's open and compliant. So he's getting way more volume than he should. He's not getting six ml, he's probably getting 12 mLs per kilo relative to his size. The alveoli above him are backing out of the way. They're supposed to push back. They're not. These two guys at the bottom, uh, underneath that opening alveolus, are collapsing. So he's getting them open. He's just not keeping them open. So the way we use conventional ventilation on the jet is exactly like this. We give enough volume, enough pressure to get the lung open. But then we optimize our peak because we want to eliminate alveolar stress. So on the right, same tidal volume, different peak. And now look at that one in the middle is stable. He's not overexpanding. The ones below him aren't backing out of the way or the ones above him. The ones below him are not collapsing at the end of exhalation. So once you optimize PEEP, that's when you can get rid of your conventional breaths on the jet. And then you're, you're gonna, because you're still gonna have alveolar strain. Over time, you are gonna, uh, enjoy, it's kind of like a paper clip. You know, over here, if you take a stick and you snap it, that's stress. But a paperclip, you keep bending it and bending it. And you're going to strain it, and over time, the paperclip's going to snap. So we try to get rid of the conventional breaths, and this is about as gentle as you're going to be. All that sparkly stuff, I wondered what that was, and he said that's alveolar blood, capillary blood flow around the alveoli. So if you see all that glowing, that's good because you're not disrupting pulmonary capillary blood flow. So beautiful. That's the best way to ventilate, I think. Relieve the stress and the strain. I'll go into more detail on the right strategy. And then lastly, the jet can be converted to an oscillator, sort of. <laughs> uh, what I mean by that is if, if you get a new fellow who's never used the jet, maybe they're afraid of the jet a little bit, but they're comfortable with the oscillator. You can convert the jet to an oscillator. And all you need is three pieces of tape. You can tell the person who's afraid. They, maybe they want to get the oscillator because they said, oh my God, our peep is almost nine. Get the oscillator. And you say, well, where do you want to set the oscillator? Uh, I want to maybe a mean of 16, an amplitude of 28. They'll give you some numbers. You say, okay, how are you going to set the mean on the oscillator? And they might mansplain to you. They'll say, well, there's a knob on the oscillator. It says MAP, sometimes it says PAW, probably that's airway pressure. You turn that up and the mean comes up. Because you guys are smart, you say, no, it doesn't. You, there's no knob on any ventilator that can just turn up the mean air pressure and leave everything else the same. Mean is math, it's a, it's a calculation. When, when mean goes up, it means something else is contributed to it. So what are you really turning up? They said, well, probably the distal pressure, peep. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. The oscillator does it right. So tell you what, we can turn this into an oscillator if you'd be more comfortable. I really would. <laughs> well, we love servo pressure over there. Servo pressure is a really good number, but for now, let's just cover it up with a piece of tape. So all you need is three pieces of tape to turn the jet into an oscillator. Uh, so if you subtract PEEP from PIP, what do you get? And they'll get out of their calculator on their phone and they'll say, it looks like 13.8. Yeah, it's right there. The amplitude is 13.8. It's the difference between PIP and PEEP. So let's cover up PIP and let's cover up PEEP. Ta-da! There's your amplitude. There's your mean area pressure. You want to go to a mean of 16? Let's do it. Well, I can't because I'll have to turn up the ah, PEEP. I get it. The oscillator taught us the best way to increase mean is by turning up the distal distending pressure. Peep. So th this looks goofy, but it, it's real. I'm really sincere about this. Is if you have somebody who's peepophobic, which I was for many years, tell them not to look at the peep. Just look at the mean area pressure. People are less mapophobic than they are peepophobic. If you only have one piece of tape, you can. I saw somebody do this at uh, Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. <laughs> They had one piece of tape. They covered up people. They said, pre-map. This is the best way to get you to the map that you want. So less and less now are we looking at PEEP, unless it's to detect inadvertent PEEP, which now we know how to do. Um, so keep that in mind. And with that, I can't thank you guys enough. I love this place. I've probably been coming here more than anywhere else <laughs> in North America. And uh, I always appreciate the people here. They've become dear friends of mine. And uh, it's 
truly an honor to get back out on the road as a retired guy and spend some time with you today. Any questions? Michael. Yes, sir. Um, my, my question is, you talked about um, looking at the, the measured speed at the distal end of the tube. And I heard you say that you should first try reducing the rate uh, or the frequency. Uh, we often we often use a frequency between 240 and 300. Um, so I guess, would you say as a matter of practice, step one, if you're on, if you're above 240, reduce down to 240. And step two, think about increasing speed. Yes. In case of plot theory. Like, is there ever a situation, I guess, that you would look at an x-ray or you would, I'm thinking of for our students as well. I mean, I, I need to know this too. Would there be a sign that you do an x-ray or these days long ultrasound, but you do some imaging? Is there something that you would ever see that you would say, oh, no, no, we need more peep as opposed to reducing the frequency? Or is step one always by a lower frequency? That's a great question. Uh, Dr. Marty Kessler told me one time um, that as a general rule, if you have um, uniform hyperinflation, you might need more PEEP. Or excuse me, you might, you might need more expiratory time. Right? If you have regional hyperinflation, you might need more PEEP. Right? Because what's happening is gas is getting trapped on the distal side of the collapsing airways. And so that might be an indication that you need more PEEP. It's, if the if the hyperinflation is regional, yeah. And now he said now there's exceptions to that. It's a general rule, but it's a good way to think about it, I think. Um, and then another thing, Michael, since you brought it up, um, what I'm reluctant to promote this idea, but most of my co my former colleagues are now promoting what they call the rule of five. The rule, the rule of five, five is if you come in and the baby's not saturating well, it could be, it that, could be that he's collapsing a little bit. Maybe you don't maybe have enough, enough peak. So the, rule, so of the five, rule of five, what they do, and uh, they say it's working, but I'm so I'm not promoting this, but it's something to think about. Is just think of five. You're going to set the pip five centimeters above your peep. You're going to give a 0.5 i time, and um, you're going to give five breaths per minute for five minutes. So everything's five. A pip five centimeters higher than your peep, an i time of 0.5, a rate of five for five minutes. And they said they, they come on at the very beginning of their shift, and if the kids are desaturating, they'll do that. And then they'll go back to CPAP. And they said that usually gets the kid under control. But that's conventional breath. Yes, conventional breath. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sold on the idea because I think what, what they're doing, the reason they're having to do that is they don't have enough peep. So I think your question is really important, and you're probably spot on. It. I'd be thinking more about optimizing peep. I don't think you have to do that rule of five thing. But it could be something that is really helpful if you're, you know, the kid's just struggling a little bit, maybe he collapses over 12 hour shift a little bit, just prop him up a little bit without, without keeping the breaths. But the problem some people get into is they'll give five breaths and they'll just leave them on. I calculated that's 7,200 breaths a day, five breaths per minute. <laughs> and uh, so it doesn't sound like a lot, but over time, that kid's going to get a lot of these if you don't get rid of them. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I know. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Like uh, one thing you have to say, to say regarding this debate about uh, post resuscitation of an uh, extensive dance, like Michael Clint's premise, post, post resuscitation after birth, some advocate like start them on conventional ventilator, some say because death is increases low pressure, low side of low pressure ventilation and all that, put them on high frequency death ventilation. So what what we do for which patients? For microprimi. Microprimi. Yeah, immediately post resuscitation. Usually we don't use them uh, we don't use adequate death ventilation as a first line. Some are now advocating using it as first line instead of conventional death ventilation. Yeah, the the guy that I talked about in my last lecture is uh, Dr. Jonathan Klein at University of Iowa, and uh, he's having incredible success. I'm, I'm going to share some statistics in my next talk uh, on the micropreening. And he, he said, my goal is to get him on within 10 minutes of life. He said, so if I take a baby by C-section, let's say, and it's a 22 to 24 a weeker, I try to get him on within 10 minutes of life. What we do first is we give a little bit of NIV, 
and we see if they're tolerated. But the problem, and I'm gonna talk about this in my second lecture, but I'll give you a preview, is they can still get injured if you're struggling with non-invasive. Uh, sometimes we try so hard to keep a kid from being intubated that we um, that they'll get injured over time. And there was a kid in the Eastern part of Canada, I won't reveal what hospital, but they struggled with this 24 weeker for 25 days, uh, trying to keep him from being intubated because they kept, you know, you get under this impression that the worst thing is intubation. And so finally they gave up the ghost and they intubated him and they got an x-ray to see placement and all that. And they had chronic lung disease and he'd never been intubated. So I think you can struggle too long on these kids. Uh, the other thing that he says is on a micropremi, because he uses these ridiculous settings. He, he uses a peep of five, and he uses a pip only six to eight centimeters above his peep. Uh, and uh, he got really mad at us a couple of times because we were answering hotline calls from his therapist and telling them to go up to peeps of eight or nine. And he said, why are you telling my therapist to go up to eight or nine? I said, because the baby's sick. <laughs> And he said, no, we only want to be peeps of five. And so finally at the last PAS conference, we always had this battle with him. Uh, he's friendly battle, you know, but uh, we reminded him that when you get a micro premium on 10 minutes of life, that baby's not injured. His lungs are, fresh. there's no injury. And that's why you can get away with peep of five. And you're getting them on the jet because you're trying to prevent the injury. But by the patients they're calling us about, they're older, sicker kids, they're injured. We need higher peeps on those kids. Um, but I think the secret of the success is what you're saying. It's early intervention, first line, and getting them on that gentle stuff we talked about today, uh, rather than you know giving them big bolus press with the conventional. Does, does that help at all? <laughs> I, I'm wondering if you could speak to this pedophobia. Um, yeah. <laughs> A few years ago, I think it was about three CPS meetings ago, Brad Yoberson spoke about non-invasive ventilation, which I realize is not this per se, but you just touched on uh, the non-invasive component. We talked about a debate. We got he and I got into a friendly debate <laughs> um, because in his talk, he really talked about using PEEP, or it's not not so much PEEP. Sorry, it was on CPAP. Um, pressures of five to seven. Um, and then when I raised the point that with the Fabian uh, or certainly now with non-invasive, uh, people are using pressures of 10, 12. I mean, uh, Toronto reported 26 for a, a pressure at one point on, on uh, nasal high frequency. Um, he, he claimed that there was really no evidence for the support of these higher pressures. And I just wondered, in your travels, is this an American sentiment that there's a general avoidance of higher pressures non-invasively? Because I wonder, and I'll be quiet in a moment, but no, that's I wonder when I look at some of these long-term outcome studies, and I look at how many kids are coming out of these studies going home on oxygen, and I wonder how many of these kids had attempts to deal with them non-invasively aborted early when they failed at plus seven or plus eight rather than pushing to higher numbers and keeping the tube out. Yes. Like, I, is this a commonly held thing? I think it is. I think it is. And uh, yeah, I did a study with Brad and Kurt Albertine at uh, University of Utah using the jet for non-invasive. And the animals did great. You know, the, Amelia was the name of our lamb. We did, they have a lamb intensive care unit. And the lamb did great non-invasively. And I can't remember what pressures we use, but I think the problem is they, they do kind of fear those higher pressures. And um, I saw that people that were failing extubation from the jet, for instance, uh, Dr. Marty Kessler ran into this, and then there's a therapist in British Columbia, uh, actually in uh, New Westminster, that ran into this. And they both discovered it simultaneously, but on opposite ends of the, the continent. Uh, what they found is when they were trying to extubate from the jet, non-invasive, they would take a measure of their last recorded PEEP and they would start the nasal CPAP on the last recorded PEEP. And they were successful 63 and 67% of the time, depending on which one you talk to. And so what they realized was it's hard to go from having the tube in to having the tube out. Um, and um, we don't really know what we're doing through prongs all the time. So Marty said, what I did is I took the prongs out of the kid and I set it on the bed. It's still reading the PEEP. 
how can it be three when it's not even in the patient? So what they started doing is targeting mean area pressure rather than PEEP. And on the jet, your mean's always gonna be about three centimeters higher than your PEEP. Um, so if you're on a mean of five, or if you're on a PEEP of five, your jet's probably gonna be reading a mean of about eight. So if you're gonna extubate that kid from jet to nasal CPAP, 10 towards the eight rather than the five. And I wondered, you know, why are people so afraid of going up on pressures? And that's still not much, but again, those kids are, are getting better. And so I reached out to uh, three docs. One was Colin Morley, who's done a lot of work with nasal CPAP in England. And, um, and I said, if you have this scenario, and I gave him a PEEP reading, a PIP reading, a rate and all that. I said, where would you set as non-invasive as you extubated it? And they all said 10 towards the mean area pressure. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, there is one guy in the United States that is not afraid of raising the PIP. And that's uh, Dr. Ram. But, Ram, uh, Ramanathan, the guy who invented the Ram. I always say Ram because of his Ram cannula. I said, did you name that after yourself? And he goes, no, no, it's like a Ram's horns. And I said, yeah, right. Um, but uh, he's using the jet non-invasively. He's not afraid of rape. He's had a lot of success or, or PIP. But I, the problem I have with his study, uh, with his technique, is that he's using background rates of 40 on the conventional. And uh, so I don't know what the jet's doing because, you know, nasal, you're giving 40 breaths through the nose. I, I'm just not comfortable with it yet. But yeah, I think there's a general tendency to err on the side of not enough pressure when you go non-invasively. And uh, especially when you're trying to excavate a kid from the jet, don't be afraid to give a little bit more oomph through the nose before you start to move. Uh, Molly, I think, had her hand up. Uh -huh. oh. We're turning up the volume, Molly. Go ahead. Okay. She might have gone. She had to go early. Molly, are you muted? Michael, you know me well. Yes, I'm often muted when I'm trying to talk. <laughs> Maybe because people want to mute me, but that's another story. Um, so thank you very much, Evan. Going back to the sure. beginning of your talk, um, you said that if you're at the resonant, resonant frequency, then, and this was the animal, would be very comfortable, not breathing at all. Okay. One of the complaints we often get in our NICU is that the babies, they don't like the jet, they're not comfortable, so they're given more sedation and more sedation, etc. So my question to you is, and Michael has already talked about the, the um, frequencies that we tend to use. Um, should we, in fact, once it's realized that there is nothing, the baby's not with wet diaper, the baby's not needing suctioning or whatever, should we be playing a bit more with the frequency? Yeah. We need to turn it down now. Um, I think I, I differ with some of my colleagues. Um, one of the things we've learned about the jet is for years, we had things that were carved in stone when it came to patient management. And one of the last that we gave up was eye time. You know, we're changing eye time more than we used to. But for a long time, we wouldn't change the rate. 420 was the magic number. So when Bert retired, here's a little bit of our, our inside scoop on Vanel. When Bert retired, I had lunch with him and I just said, Bert, now I just want to make sure I got this straight. 420 was right in the middle of resonant frequency, the high and low above which uh, we're, you know, above or below which you're not going to get much of an effect. And 420 is the magic number because you're right in the middle of resonant frequency. Is that correct? And he said, no. <laughs> I said, well, why 420? He goes, because that was in right in the middle of the high and the low. That's the only reason we change, changed that number. So what we learned was rate was not carved in stone. And so we started getting enamored with lowering the rates because of that expiratory time uh, consequence or benefit, you might say where we could really get a good IE ratio sufficient to avoid gas trapping. But as we tend to do, sometimes we get over enamored with stuff and we have to remember that rate still matters. And that's where I differ with some of my other colleagues is they, they keep saying lower rates. So I know at Sunnybrook, for instance, they tend to start kids on 240 and then go up if they have to. Uh, but people used to be afraid to go anywhere other than 420. But as we've gotten more enamored with lower rates, I think sometimes we err on the side of not enough because that's your minute ventilation. So yes, I do think that uh, 
resonant frequency, it's a big target. It's about a 200 breath range in which you have uh, to get roughly the same effect. But I think going up on the rate matters. Um, you know, if you change the eye time, let's say from 0 0.02 to 0 0.024, you're going from two one hundredths of a second to 2.4 hundredths of a second. That's not a big change. You're going from 20 thousandths of a second to 24 thousandths of a second. It doesn't sound like a big change, but the reason that has such a strong effect on CO2 is rates. That little change is going to happen anywhere from 240 to 420 times a minute. So I think you're onto something, Molly, is if you get those kids that are struggling, um, they're uncomfortable, they seem to be uncomfortable. It could be that you just need more rate. Uh, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't get too crazy about going up back to 420. It's not a carved in stone number. The other thing I want to touch on is sedation. Um, I have this ad hoc committee, and some of you in this room or listening to me may have received these emails from me. I put your email in the BCC, but it's physicians I really trust who can help me when I'm stuck. Uh, because, you know, I don't know everything, obviously. Uh, I'm, the, the, I'm the slowest kid in the class, and I have to learn to explain things in a way I can understand them. Um, so when I get into a quandary, I'll usually throw it out to this ad hoc advisory committee. And there's about 14, 15 physicians all around the world that I, I reach out to. And um, one of them was sedation. I kept getting this question about sedation uh, when I went to Foothills Hospital in Calgary. And the same physician said, every time we have a kid on the jet, they're uncomfortable and, and uh, they, 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 don't, they need sedation. And I said, well, that's not the general trend. I, you know, I don't hear a lot of that going on, but you know, maybe it does. I'll reach out to my ad hoc committee. So I sent it out and I said, what's going on with the jet? Why, are, why would kids be uncomfortable? Why would they be less stable? Why would they be fighting the ventilator more? Why do we give sedation? When do we give sedation? I had all these questions. Without exception, every answer came back the same way. They said, sometimes a kid needs sedation, but before you give it, examine your strategy. Are you not giving the kid what he needs? And rate might fall into that category. Maybe if you're on, I think Michael said, you're usually on 240 to 300, maybe 360. You know, if, if you've done everything right, the kid's still struggling. But I like the idea that you're starting 240 to 300. I think that's great because you're proactively avoiding gas trapping. But it may be something to consider if the kid is unstable, it's going up on the rate a little bit. The other thing you can do is make sure you have enough peak. That could be the kid, reason the kid's struggling. Um, yeah, so I, I think, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks, thanks Evan. Thank you. So I would just leave uh, a question from Nico before going to Anne, because the time is also up. So Nico is saying, thank you for your talk. Do we need to use backup rates routinely to prevent epilepsies when infant on jet, or only when epilepsies is happening? Yeah, that's a really, that's an excellent question, uh, because there's some controversy on that. I tend to like to be on CPAP. Oh, I feel, I, I've always felt that if you uh, have optimized your PEEP, you don't need the conventional rate. However, Marty Kessler, one of the docs that told me this was Marty. He said, um, I tend to give one or two quite often, depending on if the kid has air leaks, I don't give any at all. But if he doesn't, I, I only give one to two. And he said, because of alveolar growth. And so I started looking into alveolar growth and I got all the data I could find from Vinnie Batani and Alan Job and all those people on estimated alveolar growth in a fetus and a, and a newborn. And when I ran the numbers, babies are growing about 3.3 alveoli per second until they're six or seven or eight. And then it slows down quite a bit. But um, that's a lot of alveoli. And so Marty said that, you know, if I give one to two breaths per minute, then um, it, you know there's going to be a lot of new alveoli in that amount of time, and some of them may be out of lactatic. And so going out and giving the KU no side breath may not be a bad thing. Um, and you're sent, you have a new alveolus, and he said, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm collapsed. I don't know what to do. And the side breath comes out open. Well, this is what you do. You stay open, and now we have enough peak to stabilize it. So I think one breath every 30 to 60 seconds, if you're on a rate of one or two, probably probably isn't a bad idea if you feel like you've optimized peak and you're still you're still struggling um not a bad idea so, and? oh uh, also uh, in, oh i'm sorry that previous question uh what i talked about earlier that rule of five 
that I talked about. That's part of the reason they're doing that is because after a 12 hour shift, you're going to have thousands and thousands of new alveoli. So giving that little five, you know, I time of 0.5, five centimeters above your peak on the conventional breath, um, five breaths per minute for five minutes may not be a bad idea. Uh, and then you can go back to your CPAP. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, can you hear me, Evan? Yes, I can. Thanks to this gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent presentation. Every time you came to Benefic, I learned something from you. You always bring some new thing, the preview of what you need to practice in North America, I have to say. Uh, I have one comment, and also I have one question. One comment is that, that uh, recently I have a surgeon who operated a CDH baby on the jet. Um, my old kind of uh, concept was we have to switch to conventional for any surgery operation. But this particular, like uh, Richard Kaiser, he said, oh, I prefer jet. Now you just uh, confirmed, I don't need to go to the literature actually <laughs> right now, dear Monster. <laughs> actually paper in the OR using the jet, which is uh, um, a new knowledge that uh, I learned from you today. Well, Another before, you ask your question, before you ask your question, um, what I can do is I have the protocol that was developed at Duke for when to use the jet, when to use the oscillator intraoperatively, and I'd be happy to send that to Michael or somebody and he'll distribute it to you. Okay, keep going That'll your question. That would be fantastic. If we can do that, I can just forward it to the surgical team as well. Because it is okay. easier from my end to ventilate the baby on the jet and go to the OR and come back. We don't need to do dramatic changes post-OR. OK, go to the question. Uh, I'm not talking about the sedation, but I have to mention it. Uh, we have the same experience as, as you mentioned in Calgary. When the baby we put on the jet, uh, um, and it, uh, we were asked to put the baby on sedations, lots of lots of sedations. So uh, we try to avoid those sedations. We try to let the baby stay unconventional. But that is not my question. My question is just for my curiosity, you're talking about the tidal volume from conventional versus to the high frequency jet. What I normally do is um, if a baby cannot be ventilated at six milligram per kilo, then it's probably the time we have to switch to the, to the jet. Is there any way that uh, we can calculate the volume, tidal volume on the jet? I know it's 0.4, you said 0.4 to 1.2 minimal per kilo. But is there any way you sort of gave kind of rough idea if you're unconventional and then if you go to the jet, what's the rough yeah. uh, the volume? Not really. Um, I, I went to Perth and worked with Jane Pillow a while back and we set up the jet in the lab and it's not easy to do that. Uh, but that's where she she's the one that gave us those values. Um, but we haven't really found a way to do it. And a conventional ventilator that might have a volume measurement uh, with a transducer in it doesn't work with the jet because of that double helical bidirectional flow. We've never been able to use sophisticated uh, waveform analysis from a conventional ventilator when a jet's running because the jet confuses it. Um, so as yet, we don't have a way to do it. Now, I probably shouldn't talk about this, but I'm retired, so I guess I can. <laughs> uh, right now, they're earnestly working on the 205. The 204, which going back to your earlier point with surgery, has made it easier to take the jet into the OR because it has a built-in battery, uh, prior, uh, prioritized alarm systems. It's half the size, half the weight as our old one. But, um, but they're, they're earnestly working on the 205, and that will have volume in it, volume measurements. It also have data recording, you know, like we're jumping into the 21st century 22 years into it, <laughs> um, but we hope to have that soon. But as yet, we don't really have a good way to do that. Good, thank you very much. For which? Oh, yes, yes. So at some point, 
any time there was a broadcast done with a complete interest telling the truth, again, as like a person who's all called from like an all called perspective, when, like my question is more about the timing, so sometimes we hear, okay, the PC was 1278, for example, but it's heading the right way. Yes. How soon would I be to see the next broadcast? Is that what, is it 98, well, 78, oh, it's heading the right way. So again, a lot of times we're asked, when do we do the next broadcast? Do we do yeah. the same setting? Or is it going to still drop? I know conventional takes minutes for the CO2 to kind of reflect the speed of the broadcast. And yet, the way it works, or the way it's explained by you, yeah. the, the small bursts, it might still take a while for CO2 to be it, it all depends on the pathophysiology and the pathogenesis of the disease, but you're really on to something important because I feel, based in my own experience, that with the jet, changes can happen fast. Um, we, I remember my a hotline call I got where this doc was uh, couldn't ventilate this kid. Uh, he said, I don't know what's going on. Um, I, you know, the CO2 was one. No, I think we've got up to 126. And um, he said, I, my PIP is maxed out to 50. I can't go any higher on my PIP. And this is when I was just learning about ITON. And uh, I said, are you willing to go up on the ITON? I just learned from Jane Pillow in Australia uh, that, and a couple others that are starting to use ITON for CO2 removal. He goes, yeah, I'm willing to. What, what should I go to? And I go, go from 0.02 to 0.034. So he started hitting the button and he went up to 0 0.034. He said, it won't go any higher than that. You want me to go from the lowest to the highest? I said, yeah, you know, I blew it off. It was my fault. He said, I said, you're only going from 20 thousandths of a second to 34 thousandths of a second. Not a big deal. And he agreed. He said, yeah, that's not much. But what we forgot about was that rate thing. He was on a rate of 360. And so that little change we were going to make was going to happen 360 times a minute, six times per second. And I said, will you call me back when you get a blood gas? And he said, yeah. So he called me back 30 minutes later, and the CO2 went from 126 to 29 in 30 minutes. So it's really hard to know how long it's going to take you know, before you should get another blood gas. But the way you, you address that is you make small changes. You know, When you're changing things on the jet, because of that minute ventilation factor in the rate, things can happen pretty quickly. Um, so give us some time. The hardest thing we have to do is, I think, I'm not a physician, but I think there's two of the hardest things you have to do as a physician. Number one is to end care for a desperately ill, medically complex baby. I can't imagine trying to tell parents, you know, the, the baby's going to die. But I think one, one of the other hardest things you have to do is be patient. You know, you want these kids to get better. But I, I think with the jet, it, it could happen pretty fast. So I would tend to get a blood gas, you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, if you're unsure. Uh, if you have a CO2 monitor uh, and you have an oximeter, that might help you. Servo pressure can help you. Uh, you know, servo pressure is a good gauge of what's going on inside the lungs. Um, if servo pressure goes up, your compliance could be getting better. If servo pressure goes down, it could be getting worse. Servo pressure goes up. What it's saying is I need more gas to hit the same pressure. So servo pressure will go up. Um, uh, if you extubate, servo pressure will go up. Uh, if you develop a pneumothorax, servo pressure will go up. Then it will go down because of tension. You know, Understanding servo pressure can give you a lot of information that might prevent you from having to get a blood gas. You know, We don't want to get too many blood gases, but uh, I guess the direct answer to your question is be prepared to maybe get a guess a little bit sooner when they're on the jet because I think change happens quicker. And I'm only saying that because I'm so gun shy after that hotline call I took. Uh, it's been a few years now, but I, it still haunts me. That's too much, too fast. Um, Do you mind to elaborate more about the servo pressure? Too? The servo pressure, yeah. The way I learned to understand servo pressure was uh, driving a clutch. Uh, you know, I, I, my middle daughter, she's very impatient. She's one of the most fun people ever to be around, but she's very impatient. Like with soccer, I was trying to teach her soccer. She's a very good soccer player and I was trying to work with her. And she got disappointed quickly and we get angry. So then we had to learn how to parallel park. That that took some doing. She panicked a few times and got angry. Uh, I love this kid to pieces. Boy, she's got a short fuse. And um, then I had to teach her to drive a, a stick. I thought, hey, 
this is, you know, as we're doing this, I said, this reminds me of servo pressure. Um, oh, wait. No, let me, let me change my analogy. I got a better one. After all of that, bicycle tires. I've got a mountain bike and a road bike. Mountain bike has big fat tires. Road bike has little skinny tires. If I flatten both those tires and I decide I want to pump them up just to find out what several pressure is, I'm going to pump each tire up to 50. Most people will tell me I'm nuts. You need a lot more than 50 on a road bike tire. And they said, you don't need 50. That's way too much on a mountain bike tire. So I want to do it just so I can understand servo pressure. So I put my pump on the road bike, and I've done this myself on my own bikes, and I pump for probably 10, 15 times, and I'm at 50 PSI. My tire is still flat. So I take the pump over to the mountain bike, and I pump 10 or 15 times. I'm not even close. So I keep going, I keep going. It might take five minutes, and I finally get up to 50, um, a pressure of 50 in that tire. Which tire has more pressure? One is overinflated, one is still partially flat. It's a trick question. They both have the same amount of pressure, right? 50. Which one has more gas in it? Mountain bike, yeah. It takes a lot more gas to hit the same pressure in a bigger, more compliant tire than it does a smaller, less compliant tire. If we take that same analogy to servo pressure, it takes a lot more servo pressure to hit the same pip in a bigger, more compliant baby than it does a smaller, less compliant baby. So the bigger the baby is, or the more compliant the baby is, or the space that the jet has to fill, sometimes it's not the baby, if the extubator got a pneumo, the higher the servo pressure is going to be. The, the lower, the smaller the baby or the less compliant the baby, the lower the servo pressure is going to be. If you're ventilating a 22 weaker at a PIP of 30, your servo pressure is probably only going to be 2.1. If you're ventilating that seven-year-old in Fort Lauderdale at a PIP of 30, your servo pressure is probably going to be 16 or 17. It takes a lot more gas to hit the same pressure in a bigger space than a smaller space. With that in mind, and to your question, what would happen to servo pressure if the baby, if the tube went down the baby's right instant? Would the servo pressure go up or down? What do you think? You just go down? Down, yes. Yep. Uh, what happened is, okay, I need a certain amount of servo pressure for two lungs to hit this pressure that you've dialed in. The tube goes down the right main stem, exactly what you said. Uh, initially, PIP's going to go up, but the jet's going to say, hey, you're supposed to be at 30, not 42. So it's going to start to turn its servo pressure down until it gets back to that pressure of 30. Um, so you're exactly right. Now, what would happen to servo pressure if you recognize that and you pull the tube out and you start a ventilator both of them? Servo's going to go up, right? What would happen to servo pressure if the baby needed suction? It would probably go down, right? Because you're starting to fill the airways up with mucus. And so that space the jet doesn't have to fill. The jet's always looking for the amount of space it has to fill. And uh, the more space it has to fill, the higher the servo will be. Um, so yeah, that's good. Does that make sense a little bit? Yeah. yeah. But basically, a, a, a good summary of servo pressure is servo pressure is trying to maintain the monitor pip at your set value. And if the pip goes up, the servo is going to go up. If the pip goes down, the servo is going to go up. So just keep that in mind. What caused the pip to go up? Or what caused the pip to go down? Have you mentioned the other two differences between jet and oscillation? You know the I time. The yeah, they're in my next talk, but I can mention them now too. No, I, I'd be happy to. One is I time. One is exhalation. We talked about passive versus active exhalation. And the other one is how you recruit. With an oscillator, you use mean area pressure not only to keep the lungs open, but to get them open. With the jet, you use an occasional side breath to get them open, and then you use PEEP to keep them open. So typically with a jet, you can use less mean area pressure because you're not relying on mean to recruit. Now, if you have pulmonary air leaks, if you're treating a PIE baby, it's probably safer to recruit more like the oscillator does, where you just turn up your peak rather than using those side breaths. 
to try to recruit. But then, so if the baby has PIE on one side and LLX, is, that's a tough kid. Um, but um, yeah, you're going to have to get them open. And I, you know, I think the best way to do it is an occasional side breath. But I'm going to talk about the better way to do it with a longer eye time, lower pressure. Yeah, so in summary, it's uh, eye time is different on the outside of the jet. Um, exhalation is different, passive versus active. And then how you recruit a baby is different. So it's active on the oscillator? Yeah, oscillator, you're pushing gas in and it sucks it out as well. I think this is the, just correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is the sensor medics only, but the one with drivers can pass it, I think. Is it? I, yeah. That's what I know that the one for the sensor medics, that's what I'm trying to do, I think it is. Oh, sensor medics is definitely active. Yeah. Out, but I think for the, the other devices, it is. That's, that's good to know. I'll, I'll look into that because I, I don't know it very well. I do know the they used to have one called the Infant Star from Infrasonics, and that it, it used uh, valve time and stuff to try to create an oscillatory waveform, but it, it wasn't active as much. So yeah, that that's a good point. I'll, I'll look into that. I don't really know. Is there any superiority for any one over the other, like active or passive exploration? Passive is good. Um, I, I like passive if you're depending on the pathophysiology. You know, if uh, if if you're sucking the gas out, you tend to if you lower the pressure faster in the upper airways than you do the lower airways, you have a tendency to create what Allison Fraze and Charlie Bryan in Toronto called choke points. You know, you suck the small airways closed. So I think um, with tiny babies with micropremies, I think passive exhalation is much better. I think active exhalation works great if the problem is you, you know you just poor compliance. You got to keep the kid open somehow. Um, and the mean air pressure on the oscillator is the best way to uh, recruit. Sorry about that. I saw that. <laughs> uh, sometimes coffee spills, um, but I, I do think that um, that what the oscillator is so good at is recruiting the architecture of the lung. Making the tree look like a tree again by cranking up that mean air pressure. Now you can do it with the jet too, with Pete, but it's not as intuitive. Um, you're basically doing the same thing. But um, I think the oscillator works great in those situations where you need the mean air pressure anyway to maintain airway inflation. Uh, and then the jet, the oscillator does really good at sucking gas out. Yeah. Well, I'll look into the the Drager. I don't know. We're trying to get approval for that in the United States right now. Yeah. So. We're slow. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, one more question. Sure. Like, I know you've been working for there for like up to 30 years. Um, uh, yeah, right, for the doctor. I've worked there for 31 and I've been retired for two. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm liking retirement, except I always forget. Did I shower yesterday or was it the day before? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, my question is like, we know that for short term um, benefits, like outcome wise, comparing conventional with uh, agricultural ventilation, we know that the risk of uh, ventilator induced lung bleeding is reduced compared to the conventional uh, ventilation. But have, uh, uh, have you come across any studies com that compare the long term outcome in terms of neurodevelopmental outcome? When no. comparing the two, yeah, because I know like they said a lot of babies on jet ventilation are agitated, more need more ventilation and all that. In that case, there could be like maybe more dynamic instability, but instead fluctuation in more dynamic stability and uh affectation of the cerebral buffer auto regulation and all that. What is the neural? It's probably that's probably an area that I think is really missing in the literature. It's a longitudinal look at what happens to patients who are ventilated on the jet. The only one I know of was done in, uh, I think, Newfoundland, St. John's, under the guidance of Wayne Andrews, who's now retired, and Brian Simmons, who just retired this year. Uh, they were concerned about the noise from the patient box causing hearing problems. So they looked at kids all the way up to four years old and to see if there was an increase. And that was it with the old patient box that wasn't nearly as quiet as our new one. Uh, and after four years, they looked and there was no no effect on hearing. But I think it is an area that's sorely missing is long-term analysis. Uh, 
I don't know why I thought it, this is a really sad story, but I'll tell it to you. Um, th this shows what can happen to kids in the long run. I was at British Columbia. Uh, I was at BC Children's, and there was a near drowning kid that uh, I was getting a tour of the PICU. And he was, I think, about four years old. And he was off the ventilator. He's eating a popsicle. I didn't know who he was. And my host, uh, Dwayne Wong, he introduced me to the father because that kid was saved by the jet. He was near drowning. They found him in his mom's, his grandma's swimming pool face down. And they don't know how long he was there, but those kids can be really tough. And we got him through and he, he survived. And last time I talked to Dwayne, he said, oh, I brought up that kid. And he goes, sad longitudinal story on that kid. Result, one year, almost to the exact date, that kid fell into a canal and, and drowned. He died. <laughs> and I thought that kid just wasn't meant to swim, you know. But I, I digress a little bit. But uh, yeah, I think that long-term look at, at how kids have done, especially now that we're doing micropremies, is going to be really important. Maybe that's something I could run by Dr. Klein because he's kind of leading the charge on these micropremies. And he's he's such a, a detail guy. I can ask if he's doing that. I communicate with him all the time. So I'll, I'll email and then I'll email Michael. If I can get your email, that'd be good. And I'll email people and I'll let you know what he says. I've, he's been on my ad hoc committee every once in a while. I try to put him in the BCC field so they don't know. I don't want somebody to say, oh, I know how Michael's going to answer. So I'm going to answer that way too, or something. Like, or I know how Michael's going to answer. So I'm going to say just the opposite thing, you know, depending on. <laughs> uh, I don't want to, uh, to influence, but I'll, I'll talk to Don, Dr. Klein directly and say, are you planning some longitudinal studies? I think that's a great idea. Thank you. you got yes, sir. Um, to try to Sometimes, like the, when I get a baby with the high pressure and you are in the CIP, so or there's a collapse area, then you need to resolve the problem with the increasing pressure. And starting like this, I like this idea too much, but the, the number they are asking is too much, like two or five to start. Like, a, I don't know, these are good questions to ask the field. Like, what is the best one? Like, what is the advantage of starting with five? Or versus two. On, because there are two options. And then I sometimes I might say, okay, okay, that's two. Sometimes I just start with five. On the conventional rate? Yeah, okay. conventional rate. So, like, okay, if I start with five, what, what is the difference if I start with two? Like, I know I'm giving uh, three more with the, yeah. the effectivity rate. The only advantage is you might get there a little quicker. Um, but the more rate you give, the more dangerous it becomes. You know, in the old days, we used to say, uh, use five to 10 breaths, babies collapsed. And then we found out that 10 breaths are worse than five, five are worse than two. Um, but I think if you're careful and, you know, like Dr. Klein, even on the micropremies, if he gives five breaths per minute, he's only 68 centimeters above his peak. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's better if you can get away with two. But it might be a little quicker to if you can get away with five. If you do five, you just make sure you're careful, you know, and don't use really, really long high times of high pips on your conventional. If you use maybe what I'm going to recommend in the next talk is pips of maybe anywhere from six, five to six um, with high times of one and a half to three seconds. You know, it's just not as dangerous. You're not getting up into that injury zone if you keep your pip low. You know, up here is where the baby gets hurt. So why why go up there trying to recruit? Two breaths is going to hurt not as much as five, but none of them will hurt as much if you use a lower pip. But it, it's hard to know. You know, I, I think five could be a little quicker, but I, I would prefer two if I could get away with it. But sometimes you can't. Yes. So it's more of a comment. There's something you said that sort of triggered something in my brain, uh -huh. which is here we have a love affair with volume guarantee. Uh, which we've had for many years, and there's a very good reason for it when we're ventilating on conventional. But, you know, Dr. Klein, it seems, is using a pressure limited uh, ventilation for these backup breaths, uh, five or six or seven above the peak. Yes. But I suspect, and I've never actually paid attention to this, and maybe there's other people in the audience that know this better than I. But when we put on a backup rate, rate using the Drager, 
I wonder if we are simply, and I suspect we are, setting our standard tidal volume of you know, 4.5 or 5 mils per kilo or 4 mils per kilo. And in so doing, when we give three to five or two to five breaths, we actually may be exposing those babies to pressures of 20, 25, you know. And so if the point is not to fully ventilate during those breaths, mm -hmm. I'm just sort of wondering out loud, maybe we all have a discussion with the RT to confirm this, but I'm wondering if really we should be looking at just, you're not trying to ventilate, right? So should we be setting up, like, should those be pressure limited? You know, if we're on a peak of 10, mm -hmm. should we be setting a, a PIP of 15, you know, or a delta P or, you know, to get to 15 rather than just letting it go higher? Because one of the comments that I have to say, we well, I've noticed, and I think some other people have noticed, the, the discussion about whether you should start babies like for 22 weeks or 23 weeks is right away on the jet to save their lungs. That's one discussion. Mm -hmm. But the other discussion is there are babies that I think for a number of reasons, whether it's genetics, whether it's chorioamunitis, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, PDAs and so forth or inflammation, they are destined for BPD. And whether you use the jet or you don't use the jet, you know, I'll hear people say, oh, we need to keep them on the jet because it's the, you know, gentle way of ventilating. But these kids still wind up, you know, at 40 weeks, they're still on CPAP or they're on a point, point 0.2 liter. And I just have been listening to you talk about, you know, decline approach. And just wondering, is one of the reasons why, it's probably not the only reason, but are we contributing in some way by using a volume guarantee for those backup breaths, which we often wind up needing to use? Yeah. And so are we injuring the lung even on the jet by using that kind of a strategy? So, I definitely think you're onto something. I would tend to try to limit that pit rather than, you know, let the volume run away with it and give a higher pit. Um, I think it's a good idea to use pressure. Limited. Yeah, because who cares if you're getting a four per kilo volume for that one breath? Of yeah, yeah. yeah. The one other thing I'll, I'll tell you about is th this occurred to me through all of this discussion, and it may or may not apply to what we just talked about. But um, one of the tricks we have with the jet is if you're struggling with the baby, um, and you notice that you know maybe the baby crumps, so you hand back the baby, and you the baby sets come up. Maybe you get his sets up to 98, you know, even 100 sometimes when you're handbagging. And then you put him back on the ventilator and he crumps again. A good trick to do is uh, use the jet as a expensive monitor. Put the jet into stand. If, if the kid's on the jet and this is happening, when you put the jet into standby to bag, as soon as your sats get up to an acceptable level, look at the jet's display because it's going to be displaying the mean air pressure of your bag. So in other words, I was at Duke University and they had a kid that kept crumping. And they said, when, he, when we bag him, we can get his sats up, but he's just not responding to the jet. I said, okay, let me watch when you bag again. So sure enough, the kid crumped, they started bagging. And they were on a mean area pressure of 9.8. I think they're on a peep of about seven. And they're on a mean of 9.8 when the kid was crumping. When they bag, they're on a mean of 12.1. So I said, you don't have enough mean air pressure. You know, when you're bagging, you're giving a mean of 12.1 ish. It's bouncing around. But when you put him back on the jet, you go back to 9.8. So we put him back on the jet. We raised his peak from seven up to 10 and he flew. You know, that was a problem. And so it's a good little trick if you're struggling with a kid is to try to find out if you have optimal peak. Uh, don't think of it as peak. Think of your, the peak is getting the mean air pressure that you got when you were successful bagging. So I'm telling you that because sometimes you get into a struggle. Uh, you're at the middle of the night, the kid's crumping, and you don't know what to do. Sometimes that handbagging trick can really help you. And um, just dial it. Sometimes it's too much. I had a hotline call where they were on a peep of 14, and the kid just flew. She did great. They got her sat or they got her FIO2 from 100 down to about 36. Then she started crumping, and they were back up to 62 by the time he called on the FIO2. And uh, so I talked to this doc, and I told him about the handbagging trick. And so sure enough, when he handbagged, 
he was on a mean of um, 14. And when he's on the ventilator, he's on a peep of 14 and a mean of 17. So we put him back on his jet. This, this kid had too much peep. So he turned the peep down to 11 and the kid flew again. And then they were able to keep weaning the peep. So it's, it could be you have too much peep or not enough, too much mean air pressure or not enough. But a good way to find out is monitor your handbag and jet. If you want, we'll sell you a jet for every bed so you can use it as a bagging monitor. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a salesman. <laughs> I don't even work for the company anymore. Very much for your time. Any more questions? Okay, and remind me, I'll, during the break, I, have, I may go have a little breakfast or something, but um, I will make a note to send you the protocol from Duke on using the jet intraoperatively. So you can get it to the person who had that question. And um, I've got a few other things I can send you too. And I'll also send you a link to Klein's protocol. He's not always right. Michael mentioned too that, you know, sometimes these babies are on for so long. He leaves the micropremies on until they are at their original gestational prediction for birth. You know, 40, if they're 22 weeks or he'll leave them on until they're 40 weeks, even though they're doing well. And I don't like, you know, I don't agree with everything he does. But it might be something to look at as you define your own protocols on how to treat these stuff babies. I'll send you that too. Sure, thank you. Okay. Thanks both for your time. My pleasure. It's so good to see you all. Oh, look at some of these babies. Oh, she just went offline, but she had a little picture of her kids. And thank you to Chris too. I got to thank Chris for getting all this set up. He's phenomenal. His communication is stellar. You're lucky to have him. I'm going to argue for a raise for that guy. And I, I know he's watching right now. So Chris, I'm working for you. <laughs> all <laughs> right. You, Thanks, Evan. everyone. Thank you.